Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, August 16th, 2018, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Hello and welcome. Oh, I'm speaking a little bit there. Welcome to this week's episode of This Is Only a Test. I'm Norm, joined by my two co-hosts, Jeremy Williams. How are you, Norman? I'm doing all right. And Kishore Hari. Uh, I'm doing great, Jeremy. Welcome to the club. <laughs> welcome to the Wearing Glasses the, on this podcast guys, oh, club. Right. Do you have the same glasses? I keep forgetting I'm wearing no, my glasses we don't today. The they look very simil- similar. I have decided glasses are now a commodity thing, so I have three pairs of the same exact glasses. It, it, that's yeah. I, I also live by that lifestyle. I have two pairs of the exact same glasses. Was it one is a backup and one is a regular day day to day wear? I've been waiting for decades for my eyesight to deteriorate enough to wear glasses because I I actually been looking forward to this. I think glasses are what? cool. I, I I am way too nerdy not to wear glasses. So wow. I'm fine. And you didn't want to be the poser. You didn't want to wear glasses. Like glass glasses. Right. No. It, I don't it, need costume glasses. It took this long for si- sitting too close to video games for this to happen for you? Yeah. I don't know. Or wearing, oh, wow. Or the correlation of having VR be out there. And and I wonder, because <laughs> actually my eyesight started to deteriorate around the time that I started doing VR heavily. Uh-oh. So I don't know. Like, I, maybe I'm a guinea pig and I've discovered something here. I think probably screens it, in general. Well, it's also possible I'm just old. Yeah, age. Yeah. Age is also a strong correlation for mm-hmm. deteriorating eyesight. Uh, well, welcome to the club. Thanks. How long uh, did it take you to pick out your your, lens, your frames? <laughs> I went through Warby Parker. Uh, they have a great return policy, it turns out. I've taken <laughs> full advantage of it three times. Oh, my God. Three um, different frames you did not like. Well, I, I thought they were fine. The ladies in the store thought they were fine. But of course. people in my well, life... That's their job. No. So I started bringing people in my life with me. To, make, to expedite the you don't process. Need their opinion. Have your own opinions. I, I don't look at them. You know what? The <laughs> ultimate judge <laughs> is the YouTube commenters. Oh, God. What do you think of Jeremy's class? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I can't wait. <laughs> uh, you did a little bit of traveling this past week. Oh, yeah. I went to, I went to Disney. I went to, well, I saw family in LA, and then we went to Disneyland. We didn't plan to go this year. But you can't not go to Disneyland when you're if in you, L.A. if you have children. If you have children. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we did that. I got to see the Pixar Fest, which uh, goes until like early September. It's Pixar Pier. It's like Pixar everything. Well, that's different. Like they, they did rebrand the whole California Adventure Pier thing to be Pixar Pier. Okay. And they did a good job with that. Now, instead of the uh, California Screaming, it's the Incredicoaster, right? Sure. And it, the cars have the Incredibles on them. Um, a, a, a new paint, updated paint treatment. Yeah. It's There's no new ride. It's like it's just mm. all been re-themed. I mean, there's already plenty of Pixar there. With exactly. The you're right. So, the like, pier. with the Pixar Fest, I'm not sure that casual Disneyland visitors would even know this is Pixar Fest. It just seems the Pixar like Pier. It's just no. I mean, the oh. Pixar Fest. Oh, what, what is Pixar Fest? Th- then? That is a celebration of this re- reopening throughout all of Disneyland. So, all of the music in Downtown Disney is uh, Pixar movie music. Interesting. Um, the parades have been rethemed Pixar. They're strictly Pixar characters. Wow. Uh, the fireworks show at Disneyland. They now do a projection mapping show in concert with that on the castle and the entire downtown Disney, uh, not downtown Disney, the Main Street, Main Street. USA. Yeah. So all those buildings have projection maps on them, and it's kind of neat. Like, you see all the characters from films on them, and then they shoot up through the spires in the castle, and they become fireworks. I am getting warm and fuzzy feelings just thinking about it because it's a, good time. It's a great place to be. Yeah. That sounds awesome. And I, more importantly, I got to see um, The Void there. You got to for go me, into the void. For me, that was like the highlight. Uh, well, you're wearing one of their t-shirts. Yeah, and it, after I wash it, it probably won't fit anymore because I'm a big man. But it's it's a that was a surprisingly good experience. I would love to talk about that maybe in the VR minute. Let's absolutely talk about that in the VR minute. But before we get to that, let's get to our. Top story this week. Jeremy is not the only one that got new glasses this week. We all, <laughs> yeah, ooh, nice. Is nice. this the top story? Yeah. Uh, let's make it the top story. Right. So we recorded the podca- last week's podcast on a Tuesday, because Jeremy, you had to leave for your LA trip basically that night. And uh, spoiler alert, we did not beat the Borg 
that night. <laughs> <laughs> we tried. We tried so hard. I don't know if we're doing. We were try. so. Cl- I, I want to go back. You do? I want. I we gotta beat the Borg. <sighs> Okay, we gotta be. I admire your persistence. Without that persistence, we would have never beaten the Rec Room Pirate Quest. Tonight, That's right. So I appreciate that. And resistance. We are the resistance. That's right. Against the Borg. Uh, so, but timing, what may not have been the best time, because unbeknownst to us, the following day, the very next day, a week ago from when we're recording this, uh, was the embargo drop for Magic Leap launch and review and prices right and prices so we weren't privy to this uh we didn't get a chance to go to florida uh but several people other people did uh and and people posted their first impressions uh this i believe was the first time press were able to publicly talk about their experiences with the magic leap one this is of course the augmented reality headset uh and uh we'd first seen images of it in the rolling stone feature and it was of course steeped in mystery for over six years the reviews, shall we say, uh, were a mixed, mixed experience. Yeah, that's what that's what like Rotten Tomatoes might call it, or or Metacritic. It was say. not mixed. universal acclaim. Unfortunately, not. And I, I think a lot of that had to do with living up to the hype. And know? and I I think that was acknowledged. Wired had a story where the very first line was, they probably one of them they regret the overhyping of it, and the hyping is partly. Wait, who, who, who regrets it? Uh, the uh, Magic Leap people. They do. Okay. Yeah. And, and part of it's their design. I think they really they embrace an idea of, of being shrouded in secrecy as companies like Apple mm-hmm. do. Uh, but when you're working on a product for six years. And, and when you have that kind of funding. I think that, then that's not necessarily their fault, right? They, it's good on them for getting the funding. Yeah. That's on the reporting. That's, that's on the tech crunches of the world and the financial reporters who think, of, well, if a company without having a product gets $2.3 billion in funding, they've got to be working on something extraordinary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the so, people that they, that they sh- who funded were shown a product that was worth that to them. Right. And, the, and we're talking about smart people, Google. Right, the Googles of the world, right. literally Google, five hundred million dollars initially, and uh, and then the, the other thing that I would say was is maybe on Magic Leap's, you know, uh, responsibility is, is the videos they showed. Right, some of the very first uh, videos they saw were that we saw out, out of them were things that looked incredible. Mm-hmm. The, the whale jumping out of the the uh, gymnasium floor, uh, the incredible video game, um, you know, portal like steampunk video game. Uh, that we saw, uh, all of that, and I, I think maybe timing-wise, us being indoctrinated into VR probably didn't didn't help them because we were starting to get a better understanding of what it would be like to have virtual experiences and mixed reality experiences with pass-through VR um, and and to be present in a, a virtual space. And this is promising to bring that into the real space, being AR. But suffice to say. What ended up being is that the, the reviews really said that this was maybe one of the best AR experiences they've had, and, but it did not transform their understanding of AR or have uh, bra- or technological breakthroughs that they thought would be, would be coming right. with this headset. How much do you think that's based on the apps that it launched with versus the, the technology itself? Uh, Let's be clear. This is a developer kit. And I yeah. think that setting that expectation right, which they did, I same with the HoloLens, right? The HoloLens didn't launch with, you know, a full-fledged app store with you know, however many developers are even in the Android Play Store, right? Uh, the Google Play Store. This is absolutely a developer kit. And as a developer kit, it's $2,300, cheaper than HoloLens when it launched at $3,000. Uh, it is a refined product. And, well, we've been using one. Yeah. So uh, to not bury the lead, uh, we were able to get our hands on a magic. They're shipping now. You out there could have one this week uh, in select cities right. <laughs> uh, b- uh, because uh, for $2,300, they're actually shipping to developers and what Magic Leap calls creators um, right now. And they've partnered with a company called Enjoy that does kind of a, um, what would you call it? concierge service mm-hmm. for technology setup? Not unlike picking up a Tesla, I understand. 
Yeah, yeah, they, they bring it to you. So uh, that's why it's in select cities, uh, San Francisco, Seattle, Atlanta, I believe, and, and a couple other cities, Chicago. Uh, the service will come to you, and they're actually, well, the things we learned with the embargo release last week was that not only is it $2,300, but there are also configuration options. There are two actual physical size differences. There's a large one for a large IPD, uh, because there is no adjustable IPD, and there's one for a small IPD. I mean, the difference is like above 60 or below 60. Okay. Uh, IPD. <coughs> so the idea is n- learn what your IPD is. Learn what your IPD is. And also there are uh, nose bridge um, attachments to have to, for a more comfortable and better fit because that's important. The alignment between its lenses to your eyes is really important. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you could, you sh- you're supposed to adjust that as well. So that's why I, I assume that's why they have their whole concierge service to make sure you have the right fit. And then also if you need to wear glasses, which all three of us do, uh, you should. they recommend that you buy uh, their um, their lenses, mm-hmm. uh, adjust the corrective lenses. Do they insert between the glass that's on the um, uh, unit and your glass? And your yeah, and your uh, eyes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so it's like having glasses. Yeah, that are exactly. Built into it. Right, right. Okay. Push right up against the lens. Uh, and we are able to. We didn't actually get to. We didn't pay for one. Uh, we found someone who had bought one and was able to loan it to us for a week. And so I've been using it this past week and we'll definitely be talking about it much more in depth in our projections episode being released uh, this week. And Jeremy, uh, since you're now back from your trip, you know, yeah. you're know you gonna spend some time with it. I get to play. And what, what, what do we wanna talk about right now though? Well, I mean, initial initial thoughts. Um, I got to use it a little bit before the show. It, it looked to me like, <clears throat> That was an interesting sound. Th- that I was, believe that, that was, was the magic leap. <laughs> that was <laughs> no. the magic leap powering down. I haven't even told you what I think of you yet. <laughs> um, I I was actually I was actually impressed because I had read the reviews, and, and so your expectations were reset. So actually. yeah, exactly. So I I mm. came at it and if initially like I I've been in, in touch with all the hype too. Like yeah. I got the the wired issue that had it on the cover. Oh yeah, I, the Kevin I Kelly story devoured it. Like yeah. I was so and when I saw that they had quote unquote solved the accommodation problem, yeah, where you can actually focus on. Dis- different distances with a single eye open. You know, the, mm-hmm. your lens of your eye can actually have an effect on what you're seeing. Like that's something you can't do in VR right now. And I was excited to see that. Um, so I'm on top of the hype. Like I'm excited for it. But all the reviews were like, eh, it's, what's the big deal? It's kind of like a little bit better than HoloLens. And uh, and so when I put this on, I was I was actually pleasantly surprised. I feel like the images are more opaque than I expected. I feel like the field of view is bigger than I expected. Mm. Um, and the tracking is is good. Like, I expected a lot more jitter having seen some of the reviews. Mm. Uh, mm. So all in all, like, there's something there. I do feel like it's a good first step. Is it, does it live up to the hype? No, in no possible way. It is, it uses technologies that we've seen before. It's an evolution. In, At uh, least in this product, who yeah. knows? Say, so, I mean, the patents that they have, right? And, and 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 that's some of the behind the scenes that we don't know, right? Like we don't know what happened in those six years between them having experimented with with uh, light fuel, their photonic chip technology, whatever they want to call it, uh, and shipping a product that looks kind of like they use. Uh, what the Hollands use is, mm-hmm. and it's a, a waveguide essentially. It's a um, diffraction in the lens, and, and, and a special way they make the lens to push light from the side that go into your eyes, so that you can see images overlaid on the real world. Yeah, it's it's apparently a very expensive technology to actually manufacture the waveguides is is terribly pricey, mm-hmm. uh, but it's neat. Like you can project light into one side of a glass, and then yep. on the other, like not just. The other side of the glass, but down the glass, a it, long, a long whole field of view. Exactly, it can re- refract back out, having reflected inside. Right. And some people say, you know, there's artifacts to that. There's a glowingness that you might detect. Yeah. It looks like looking through a prism at times. Right. They have to make it a little dimmer to make the images more opaque. I, I did notice it if I moved my head around a lot. Yeah. I did notice the colors moving at different speeds. It appeared as though uh, it was in a DLP projector. It's almost like, like the chromatic ab- aberration. Like. N- a- well, I guess so, but not in that it's not like when these images are still I don't notice it right but when you're moving it the the, the RGB bands yes separate a exactly bit. and exactly. I think that's a part of the waveguide so you know like when you move your eyes quickly across a DLP projected yep. screen you can see these rainbows yeah. it's it's kind of like that and, and and I think it makes total sense if they are using a waveguide mm-hmm. lens right that's that they are essentially it is like a prism like the mirrors of a DLP uh, without the the refresh rate the speed of a DLP does that explain why the text also blurs so much when you're when you're moving, moving your head yeah you know maybe and and the thing that we're going to solve uh, we're going to try to figure out uh, before we put out our review is one how to communicate this to you 
right? We want to we're going to go through our testing. They're yes, software experiences that come preloaded on this. They they have their Magic Leap World, which is their version of their app store, uh, and um, we'll try what's available there. And we want to find a way to film it. Uh, we've seen some videos of people online where I think they're just putting GoPros behind it, uh, one lens, obviously, so you can kind of see um, what what the experiences look like. But mm-hmm. it's, I think they'd say the problem is like, and to use their words, it's like trying to sell TV on the radio. And I totally feel them on that. Oh, because, VR is the same way, isn't it? Right, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you're capturing VR, unless someone's watching with anaglyph glasses or some type of stereo <laughs> experience, right, they're not going to get even convergence on 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 depth, right? And and or a feeling of presence here. Yet you're overlaying whatever we film. We're going to see the the real world behind the lens, and we'll be able to communicate. You know, hopefully. Uh, the, uh, the the dimming effect, yeah. right? It's basically, I, I think it's almost like one stop down, uh, like an ND filter, uh, sunglasses, if you will. And, um, but you won't be, we can't, we can't actively show the, the focus change because we're only looking through one lens right. and we're not, we can't adjust our yeah. focus on, on a GoPro. Yeah. And, and I, that's the thing I look forward to experimenting with most is, is seeing how if that actually exists. Yeah. Because I have a feeling it's not as advanced as they wanted it to be a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, still testing to be done, but my my guess, based on my uh, use of it pretty extensively this past week, is that there are two focal planes that it actively switches between. Yeah, that's... Near and infinity. That Really? Yeah. Huh. So does that mean... It some and how do you think it actually detects where your eye is focused? I think it does some type of eye tracking to to look at your pupil dilation, and because uh, the test I've done is with one eye, huh. oh, with both eyes, look at have literally hold an object in front of me, yeah, and shift in, in the real world and and shift my eyes focusing on the close and on the far, and as I change that, yeah. I can tell the rendering changes. Interesting. I you I haven't read anything about eye tracking. Do you, you think that might be in there? Yeah. Can't we detect that with some sort of looking for infrared yeah, we cameras, should be able to see it. Uh, cameras or uh, LEDs, anything that sure. would be f- eye facing? Yeah, I, I think it's right at the bottom. And you can see that. Okay, well, we'll take a closer look at that. Yeah. I was pleasantly surprised by this little computer pack. Oh, yeah, and that's the other thing, right? They're, they have their uh, the, the, the headset, and this is a tethered device, but tethered to well, a battery pack that you wear. Yeah. So you, are, you physically are untethered. That's not fair. I wouldn't call it a tethered device because what, what's the difference? If this is built into the headset, then it wouldn't right, be a tethered, right. tethered device. There's just one cable for yeah. a, what's essentially a battery and a computer. I think it's and smart. I, I, I like the design of it. It, it didn't bother me. Um, Same thing that the wireless uh, VR solutions are doing. They yeah, put the battery exactly, pack on you. Exactly. Yeah. And, and this one ergonomically... Uh, not only does it fit well, but it, I think it's, I it's think they super a light. Job. Yeah. It's super light. It does get warm. Yep. Yeah. The yep. little computer does. The computer yeah. does. And then the t- front of the headset a little bit. It's a powerful computer. It's, it's, it's more powerful than a cell phone. You know, it's more like a, like a little nook or something like that. A really powerful little guy. Like an Intel NUC. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the experiences, there's not a lot. One thing I'm really curious about is whether they'll be charging for these games um, in, in the short term. If, if, they said they've exceeded expectations on sales. Really? Um, <laughs> really? Huh. And okay. I, I don't know, who knows what their expectations were, at least on day one. I, right? So I, my question is, like, what is this destined to be a consumer device? Or the, is the it Magic Leap 1? No, whatever the, the consumer version is. Magic if, Leap 2. If this is the DK version. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, are they... I mean, if, if it's a DK, this is a polished, very polished DK. So was the Oculus DK... No. Well, you, you don't I'll feel like the DK1 DK was? This Ta- is much better than a DK1 in Ta- terms of relaying what AR is to, to users. Huh. Okay. They're, they're, and, and, and fair. And the, the DK1 didn't have motion tracking. That's yeah, true. exactly. Uh, and, and this feels more like uh, the, the, the ID, device ID of this product, the fit and finish of this. Yeah. Like, I wonder if they were designing this to be a consumer product and then realized that it was better suited to be wherever their technology was and wherever their software was. Well, they need... Content. They need content, so better CDP creator device. Uh, I would not be surprised if the Magic Leap 2 looked very much like this, mm-hmm. but maybe with improved optics, hmm. improved lenses. I, yeah, and I, but I do wonder if at that price point it can succeed as a consumer device. So what's the killer app? Especially when you have Oculus selling a $200 VR headset. Sure. Or, or VR, right, right, three, three degree of freedom. Exactly. Very no, different exactly. experience. But like, who, who, what consumers understand the difference? 
between that, six that's the tough and sell, three dots. Right? Isn't that the tough sell? AR and VR. Or AR and VR. Yeah. Isn't that such a tough sell? Uh, Aren't we going to be like more than probably if we look at the cycle of Oculus, like two years from a from a Rift 2? From an actual product, right? I mean, DK1 came at between DK1 to oh, launch. Oh, you mean, you mean from this to, to for Magic Leap 2? Yeah. Or to the consumer version. It, yeah. it feels like they need to beat, what they want to do is beat Apple to product. And they've done that with, they've kind of done that with this device. Because Apple has AR kit. And yep. Apple has their version of AR right now with lots of developers creating content for it. Even though it's not a wearable, it's just your phone, immediately accessible for, for users and, and relatively understandable. What it doesn't have, of course, is that experience of actually wearing something and mm. mixing the reality. And that's the big question. We don't know if that's going to be something that the content can be compelling enough to, to change public perception and to change behavior of consumers to wear something like this. Because Google Glass couldn't do it. And Google Glass was a passive information device. Right? Google, Glass was, Google Glass was experience the world first, the tiny bit of information you get in the corner of your eye second. Yeah. With the Magic Leap, the, from what I've used so far, it's definitely not a experience the world first, virtual stuff right. second. It's experience all the virtual things that you can put in the world and use the world as your playground for that. I saw people walking up and down Van Ness wearing Google Glass years yeah, ago. Right. Like people were Shun. trying to do this the glass holes. in the world. They're trying, trying so hard. In airports, where have you. No one's going to be wearing this. N- not initially. With purpose. Like, I mean, outside of the... Their... What are they going to do? Real-time mapping of like streets they're walking down? There's no chance. So, and, and that's a, a big question for AR, which I, I, I presume people, very smart people, um, user experience experts at... Magic Leap and, and Apple have been discussing, you know, we think that AR is going to fit, ber- fit, uh, fit best in the home first, right? It's going to be for offices and living rooms first. And once that becomes and industry. a social normal, and, and industry, uh, absolutely, yeah. right, in business. So I'm talking about in, consu- in the consumer space. Right. Right. They have to find a killer app that's going to work to m- compel people to want to put it on in the home. And then once that killer app becomes essential to their lives, whether it's communication or entertainment or, or whatever, then you start seeing it in location-based experiences and restaurants. Then you start seeing it in the world. And the final step is going to be when it's inside in the subway. Yeah, in, yeah. In, in down the street. You don't go. You don't jump to on the street first. And I think Google learned a very expensive lesson mm-hmm. with with that. Uh, all of that to say, we have a lot more testing to do with this Magic Leap One. We only have it for a few more days before we have to return it. Um, and you'll have to wait until we release our episode of Projections before learning more about what we think about it. That'll be fun. I was tempted partially to have the headset on the entire time during the podcast. Mm-hmm. Still can put it on. I still could. I still could. Um, all right. Pop culture. Hey, we're going to go back to Star Trek. So <laughs> You know what? As we were walking around Disney, my 11-year-old son, who's watched all of Next Generation, yeah. says, oh, man, I wish Disney would buy Star Trek. <laughs> because he wants to ride Star Trek rides. Wow. Like, that's what he wants. But I had never thought about that. Like, that, how weird would that be? How contorted would Star Trek become? If it was owned by it was Disneyfied. One yeah. CBS slash Paramount who need to solve their own legal differences would never do it. It's no, the crown jewel no, no, in that no, empire. No. Uh, if he was a few years older, he could have gone to the Star Trek experience in Las Vegas. Oh that actually God. was an okay ride. Been, his mind would have been blown. I heard. Pretty good I ride. missed it. I heard it was good. It was so good. No nah, man, I'll catch. The I next mean, one. you heard the intro that we play when Will goes. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. yeah. The, the bridge of the Enterprise. <laughs> the Star Trek bridge. The Enterprise D. It's so, better than yeah. any any uh, simulator, any any bridge crew experience we've had. The, yeah. Oh, wow. The pass is new again. The food uh, at Quarks was not good, though. I no, will say. No. Uh, the, the, the warp core, uh, what was it called? The, the um, there, was, there was a warp core breach. The warp core breach was a, a fun drink to have. That was their... <laughs> the warp core breach. That, that was uh, their um, a dry ice Dry ice uh, beverage. Okay. Pork. So well, clearly, you guys would embrace the Disneyfication perfectly if you're talking about how delicious the warp core breach uh, was. Uh, the sense memory I have right now is 
foam latex uh, that people were wearing on their faces and the ma- smell of makeup, I will forever associate that <coughs> with the Star Trek experience. Okay. Getting up to a Klingon, like, ooh, you smell like foam latex, <laughs> like makeup. Um, so Star Trek Discovery, of course, uh, coming back for season two. And while we have casting of Christopher Pike and also um, the Enterprise, original Enterprise, 1701, no A, B, C, or D. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Pre, uh, pre-original pre series being shown in Discovery. The character that's been kind of the, the big elephant in the room is Spock. And Spock has finally been cast. So we will see Spock in Star Trek Discovery season two. Mm-hmm. And the casting of Spock is... Mm-hmm. Not Zachary Quinto, okay. which I think troubled some Star Trek fans. Uh, the actor, his name is Ethan Peck, and if that name, name sounds, the last name sounds familiar at all, he is the grandson of Gregory Peck. Oh, related. And yeah. if you look, see, he has the eyebrows for a Spock. Uh, he hasn't been in a lot of stuff before. He was in the movie Sorcerer, Sorcerer's Apprentice mm-hmm. uh, and Ten Things I Hate About You. But I think he looks the part, and I can't see wait to see his interpretation of Spock. What are your feelings on this? I like Quinto Spock, um, so I, I would have loved to have seen that. I, I can imagine they couldn't afford it. I think both they couldn't afford it, and also the bigger, I think, for hardcore Star Trek fans is this is really a delineation between uh, the film universe and the TV universe. That's complicated. Because the film universe, it is complicated. It is is Paramount, um, Viacom, it's a Comcast company, Comcast Universal, while the other one, is a TV show, the rights are still held by CBS. Mm-hmm. And so they share a universe, they share IP, but they don't share the actors, and really they are technically different, they're realities. So I was going to ask, like, <clears throat> is there anyone at the top in charge of continuity? No, I don't think they have a Pablo Hidalgo at okay. Star Trek. I, I mean, I'm sure there are, <coughs> there are some keepers of the lore, and really it's more about the showrunners and the executives, and good thing that uh, Alex Kurtzman is, is in the position he is in now because he's such a big Star Trek fan. Uh, I'm fine with seeing Spock in this, and I think... I'm fine as long as it's not too much Spock. As long as not Spock centric, come right. What? What do you mean by that? Less, meaning that he becomes like a main character of the entire series. Oh, I see. Like if he's like some character that's like somewhere between cameo and you know recurring somewhere in that hmm. area where he's adding layers to the story, but not the focal point. But what if he becomes the most interesting character? You know. Well, I think then Discovery has missed the whole point of its show. Okay. If yeah. the most interesting character from your show is, is someone that you someone from a different show, then you failed. Yeah, uh, yeah. you guys, you guys are on board with the new Star Wars too. Okay. We are. That's all good. And, and and Discovery should be embracing the characters it created for its show, and, and they were compelling characters. I think if you watch the whole season one Discovery, you grow to learn and love these characters, and. Uh, yes, their relationships to the Star Trek universe are both in the world they live in, also actual literal familial bonds. Uh, and it's okay to show that. You had Sarek, you had Amanda. They weren't the same actors that played them as in yeah. the Star Trek movies uh, or, or the next generation. I think a lot of people um, are taken aback by this because it's just like the casting of Superman, right? You associate certain iconic actors. It's, it's a role that because the role, the character is so iconic, it consumes the the persona of the actor, right? Leonard Nimoy could never be distanced from the role of Spock, and Zachary Quinto took up that mantle, and you want the actor to revere the role and respect the role. And the fear is that when you you feel like you're exchanging actors and throwing new actors in there, and it's not about continuity or canon, it's about the respecting the role. And you saw uh, Adam Adam Nimoy, uh, Leonard Nimoy's son, you know, tweet a photo, with him and his family and this new character, hmm. this new actor playing the new Spock and welcoming welcoming him into the family. So, you know, if if Nimoy's legacy is signed off on that, then I'm looking forward to it's it. It's a lot of pressure for this guy because uh, Leonard Nimoy and Spock are so beloved. I mean, probably my favorite character from the original series. And uh, I wonder, he could take two approaches. He could do Zachary Quinto's approach, which was to try to approximate a Leonard Nimoy Spock mm-hmm. or... Say, I can't do that. And Quinto's already done it as well as I ever could. I'm going to take a different direction. Because this whole Discovery series is about taking a different approach to Star Trek. And this is a younger Spock. This is maybe, it's it's the genesis of the Spock that we knew. You know, technically, way more, eight people have played Spock. You had the baby. Really? You had the little kid. How do you know that? You had the the animated voice. I I don't believe it was Nimoy. You had, you had. Wow. Actually, I'm not sure about that last one. But yeah, uh, Star Trek forums. 
Memory Alpha. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also in the Star Trek world, speaking of the Paramount films, a little bit of turmoil. This is, I don't know, shocking a little bit, and it really goes in. It it, it dis, it's a little disillusioning because when you think of uh, the movies and the love that the creators of these movies have and the writers of the movies have, you also hope the actors have that as well. We talked about that with with the reverence for the characters, but Star Trek Four, for which. Paramount has hired a director and has a story idea, which they announced two years ago with the release of Star Trek Beyond. They said they're going to go with time travel and bring back um, uh, Kirk's father, uh, played by Chris Hemsworth Thor. in the original, right? Um, and bring him back because now he's a major movie star mm-hmm. and he's, he can sell tickets. Uh, well, both Chris Hemsworth and Chris Pine, Kirk himself, have walked away from negotiations to be in Star Trek IV. Star Trek Four with the number four, not IV, because we're going to use that to delineate uh, the Abrams verse, the Kelvin verse versus the you, original. You series. think it's money or creative differences? It's money, one hundred percent money. <laughs> but, uh, the report, and then who knows who leaked this report, and whether that's it was a power move to get one side to come back to the table, and or maybe to gauge fan response, uh, was that Paramount said the Paramount reneged on contractual obligations that they had signed with Chris Pine because they didn't make enough money on Star Trek Beyond. How much do you want to bet that there'll be a leak that both Chris Pratt and Chris Evans will be up for the roles <laughs> by the end of the week? Wait, wait, who will play who? Chris Evans as Kirk and Chris Pratt as his father? Yeah, yeah? I think that makes sense. All right. I mean, by makes sense, it makes no sense. It makes but no I sense. think it's the yeah. only thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there are some articles think, uh, speculating that you, maybe we don't... I mean, if they're going to go for the completely different story, obviously they would have to without either of those characters. But does Star Trek need Kirk in a movie? What do you, what do you mean? If, uh, you mean at, from this time period? Yeah. Yeah. No. No, you could have a... I think we could have a... I mean, there there hasn't been an original series movie without Kirk, without William Shatner. Yeah. But... That's a way to break precedent, to tell a new story. I don't think, I think the strength of the relationships, and, and yes, the relationship between Spock and Kirk in that was, uh, is the fundamental core of, the, of that family. Sure. Right. But, but Spock is the stronger character, and I think they learned that, and they knew that. And like, that Zachary Quinto really shine. Well, yes, but that's also why they brought Spock back into the series, like for, for his, right before he died. Right. People are bigger fans of Spock yeah. than they are necessarily of Kirk. It's and... just like Han Solo and Luke Skywalker. Like, you know, Han Solo oh. is not the lead. But he is the favorite. Wow. Well, then, then we're talking about a crew with maybe a new captain, or Spock is the captain. You'd have to address it some way, and you still have to tell a compelling story that would be resonant with those characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I hope they come back. I hope that the money stuff gets worked out. I hope it works out so well. There's another Vegas experience uh, for me and my. You know, son. The, the, for the longest time, the sets for for that Vegas experience were put in storage in Vegas, and. Uh, property developers before the financial bust of the uh, uh. ten years ago were all vying to build up mall space and to set it up again oh. as as an experience. But I think okay. the time has passed for that, um, unfortunately. Uh, build it anew, and, and they 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 auctioned all that stuff off. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, it's uh, you know I, I've mentioned this in the podcast before. You should watch. There's a uh, a little difficult to find documentary yeah. series that a cast member of the Star Trek experience filmed called Star Trek My Experience. Oh, neat. And it's it's like it's oh, it's way too long, but it's a like home video style, 90s yeah. camcorder film, but you see as someone who worked behind the scenes, and you won't even see this from Disney, but like filming day in day out what it would be like with this in the makeup room, a tour of the set, the parties they had. Okay. Um, and and I that would give you a little bit of the experience. And all that footage is actually on, online, the footage that they filmed and they captured of uh, that we would put on the view fi- the view screen. I almost want to say there is a VR experience where someone wants to recreate it in VR, but it's not the same. I get you. It's, it's not the same. The Enterprise, and then suddenly <laughs> the bridge of the, the Enterprise D. All right. Uh, Can I tell you? I, I rode the Guardians of the Galaxy ride too. Oh yeah. yeah. How's yeah, because that? that used to be the Tower of Terror, right? Oh, Twilight Zone, so good. which is a little not, like weird. Why was the Twilight Zone licensed at Disney? It's like it seemed a little out it of place. It was a long time ago. A little out of place. Yeah, it was, it was a part of a Disney Walt Disney World when they had it at the Hollywood Studios. So I will say that the new ride is a lot more fun. It's 
it's everyone's waving at the guardians and like cheering. 3D glasses? No. No 3D glasses. In fact, no, oh. it's not even like a volumetric like Imagineer display. It's it's 2D it's imagery. Flat. Yeah, but very high def. And also I swear it's HDR. Like it's it, the br- right. the whites are bright mm-hmm. and the blacks are good. But and it's huge. Um but it's not as cohesive. It's like the it made sense. You were in a haunted mm-hmm. tower and the elevator was out of control. Yeah, yeah. Now you're helping to free the Guardians of the Galaxy and it, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But Rocket uh, is on top of of your elevator. And he like unplugs it, so that's why it goes crazy. And then he s- connects it to um, to the Walkman. <clears throat> and it's every a, it's music. Oh, that's yeah. funny. And every time you ride the ride, it's a little different. It's a different song, but the same imagery. Yeah. So you you did it multiple times. Uh huh. Different song, same imagery. Yeah. And uh, oh, okay, I was just, I love Tower of Terror. I love the lobby. I love yeah. the hotel. The set dressing was elaborate. And yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You might like it's it though Disney-fying because it's it. it's all, all Marvel. There's this neat imagery in the in the uh, foyer like when you're in line. Yeah, There's, they spent a lot of money on that, and it looks really cool. You're in the collectors. It's it's like the collector's tower. So it's all these it's things that, that he's collected. And um, there's an abominable snowman from the from the Matterhorn in his collection. Oh, which is, which is funny. Nice. That's funny. Yeah. Crossing the universes. Yeah. Uh, speaking of a. Uh, licenses and streaming services hey uh we all love watching our disney films on netflix but we know that disney's starting up their own streaming service sometime next, next year. year and no surprise mm-hmm. didn't marvel movies n- in the future will <laughs> no longer be on netflix that's right the last marvel movie to be on netflix will be ant-man and the wasp from this year okay so no infinity war 4 right but we will get the Avengers first one we'll get the first one yeah um and no captain marvel right Captain Marvel will be the first non-Netflix Disney movie. Yeah. So that's interesting. That, 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 that They've synced up then. Like, by the time that would hit streaming is yes. when they'll launch. Yes. And, and maybe Avengers 4 will have be the one people want to watch on streaming and will get them to sign up. You know, if you watch Avengers 4 streaming now, get your free trial for whatever Disney thing is. I guess. There's a lot of reasons to sign up, in my opinion. The John Favreau series. I mean, it's the Star Wars series, yeah, the live action Star Wars. The the new. I imagine uh, they'll have a couple more announcements too before mm-hmm. it actually launches. So I'd be interested about stuff like outside the Marvel. Wow, what am I saying? Outside the Marvel and Star Wars universe too, because I think there's a ton of room duck there tales. in Disney properties. Yeah, Howard the Duck, Indiana Jones, just like everything on Disney XD, right? Well, that's the, their back catalog too. They have yeah. five thousand episodes of Disney stuff. And also the vault. How they can did open up Han- the vault? That's what I mean. Like the old Disney Channel and mm. stuff. Mm. How does Hannah Montana end, Norm? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Sophia the first. These are questions. Mm. Um, Do- Doc McStuffins. Apple, of course, is uh, starting their own. It's kind of nothing we know about it yet, but they've uh, devoted how much? Committed billions. Uh, to, for programming for their own uh, video service, and uh, they've been booking. Uh, producers and directors. The latest move they've ordered is a series uh, with the two of the um, uh, It's Always Sunny folk, Charlie Day and and Mac. This God, this show is such a staple for pop culture right now, and I've never really watched it. You've never it. watched It's Always Sunny? I've watched clips, and they're hilarious. I've just it, never sat down and watched The show's really it. wrong, and I really recommend either Charlie McDennis as a good episode to start with, and maybe that's what this show will be, is just a reenactment of that game show. Or The Dennis System is also a good, epi- you know, good episode. It's still going, right? Uh, Nightman. Uh, Nightman episode is one of my favorites. All right. Uh, there's a whole musical number that comes about. No an kidding. original musical that, okay. uh, that appears. So a couple of things are interesting about this announcement. They've ordered this straight to series, so not just a pilot. They have confidence in the creative talents of... The, you know, the, the, the writers and the folks behind uh, It's Always Sunny. And, of course, the, the Char- Charlie Day, who's you know, now genuine movie star. Uh, this is going to be produced from their production company, but also along with Ubisoft. What? what? Ubisoft is producing this. Now, that may be because hmm. the topic of the show mm-hmm. is going to be about... Uh, ch- ch- where is this? It's a half hour scripted comedy. Um, I had this down. We have the wrong story for this. Oh, I put the wrong link in. It's a, it's tech related. 
Okay. Is it game related? It's game related. Well, I think okay. it's about video game developers. That's yes, it's a series is set in a video game development studio. Oh, that's kind of interesting. So it's going to be like uh, it's a Silicon Valley. Yep. Oh, Silicon my God. Valley uh, uh, entourage for video game development. I love this idea now. And, and which makes it, <sighs> I think, makes I mean, it could be an app, it could be app developer. You know, it could be video game app, like phone developer. I don't know if it's a console developer. There's a lot of good content there. But there goes your synergy with uh, being on the Apple platform. Uh, so it, what are you talking about? Is it on the Apple platform? This is Apple is paying for the series. They're making this. Yeah. Okay, wow. Yeah. I don't know if, it's, if that's going to be the killer content, the thing that's going to get me to subscribe so to it's, the Apple. You're right then. It will, it will be an app developer, I would imagine. Making app game apps. Don't you Ubisoft? Think? I don't know. I, I think people are way more interested in terms of the... The high stakes world of console video development? game console development. Okay, although there's a lot of you know political bullshit yeah. and and controversy in that world too, and I don't know if they're going to address any of that. But anyone who's watched It's Always Sunny knows that that show has over time become more progressive. Well, everybody subversively progressive. So hopefully these people, folks are smart enough to to address those things properly. Will everybody in the show have an iPhone? Like you it's won't. Got you won't. You have think there'll any. be product placement everywhere? Well, I'm just saying. Like you won't have an Android phone in this show, right? It won't be allowed. Probably not. Yeah, that just seems weird. That's an alternate universe. It is alternate the, universe. The world that Apple loves wants to live in. But do you think they'll be heavy-handed <laughs> with it? Like everyone's wearing AirPods and right. They would be foolish to do that. They don't need that. They're paying for the service. They're not paying mm-hmm. for marketing. They're paying for good content. Yep. The iPhone will just work naturally if somebody just gets out a phone right. in the show. Yeah. If people nah. won't. Ugh. They'll, they'll make sure when people f- hold the phones up to their ears, the screen actually, the proximity sensor is working and the phone's not upside down. Or if it doesn't, it's like, cut. <laughs> the phone the phone screen stayed on. Yeah. Retake. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, last couple bits of pop culture news. Uh, Hollywood Reporter has an update on the whole James Gunn um, scandal, controversy, nonsense, whatever we want to call it. And uh, they reported last week that, yes, even though he is still technically fired from, um, from Guardians of the Galaxy 3, that Marvel still plans to use his script. Uh, and uh, other studios are now courting him heavily. And it may not be to direct a movie immediately, but they know he is talented and they know that he has a strong support base. And uh, it may be if, if Marvel doesn't want to work with him in the future... And he has not technically been blacklisted. All he has been done, all the only thing that Marvel can't walk back on without m- admitting that they were played for fools, uh, is that they, they just fired him from directing Guardians Three. Um, other studios want him to mm-hmm. potentially work for their universes. So I would love to see a James Gunn DC movie. There's oh plenty of characters goodness. in that world. Wouldn't, I don't know if he loves them. Wouldn't that be interesting? As much as, as and, he does, and would the studio have his back like Marvel had? You know, at when he made the movies. I, that's a big part of being a, a success within Marvel. I mean, well, I think at this point he's established enough. He's made two huge blockbusters yeah. and, and created a franchise. Mm-hmm. I think they got it's not a risk anymore. Those people who run the studios have opinions yeah. and power. And I think they're paid to have their opinions. And they love having their opinions. Explain what you mean by he hasn't officially been blacklisted. Uh, so. Uh, I think what the Hollywood Reporter story indicated was that Mar- even within Marvel and Marvel, uh, sorry, Disney, Disney owns Marvel, but they're not the same executive team. The folks at and Disney was the one that fired him yeah. because they're the family friendly brand. Uh, there are back channel talks, reports to Hollywood Reporter, that folks at Marvel want to get James Gunn back in the family at some point. Oh, okay. Have this whole nonsense bit cooled down. And the only edict was that he was fired from directing Guardians 3, but that's not to say I see. That, that the door couldn't be open for him to come back and direct another movie or something. So you future. didn't mean like a Hollywood-wide blacklist? No, no, no. This a is Disney, a Disney blacklist. 40% of the business, Disney, though. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, that's pretty much a blacklist. I wonder if this is the end of Guardians anyways, because we haven't had a Marvel movie go beyond three in, a, in its hmm. you know, character arc. No, that's, contracts get very expensive. Especially with that, that many... People yeah, in if, the cast. If the point is they want to make a movie, you could call Avengers. Avengers will have the fourth one. Yeah. And at that point, Iron Man will be, and, and you know, he, uh, Robert Downey Jr. was paid the fifty million to be in Civil War. So, but some of these just like they run their course, right? So, yeah. I I wonder if they're uh, they just want to target him for a whole different property. Reboot the universe. This is the the thing that 
Hollywood will have to grapple with that comic book creators don't necessarily have to. Spider-Man's been Peter Parker since he's been created. And yes, there have been soft reboots, and but he's basically been in that same universe and that the whole history carries with him. Different artists, sure, but the act- actors get old and they'll have to reboot at some point. And then, then you'll see whether the strength was the character or the actor. It's always the actor, I think. You think? You, well, Spider Man has proven otherwise. Yeah, I don't think so. You don't, hit, you don't. Think, there have been three Spider Mans in a decade. Yeah, but hasn't the success of the films been based on how on the quality of the acting and the, and the writing? But the, what's get what gets people to buy in initially is the character. Spider Man will always be Spider Man. Although Fox hasn't recast Wolverine yet, mm. right? Yet it's coming. Yet. So well acted. Yeah. Well, even though they've done it with uh, all the other characters in their, in their essential reboot. Um, and uh, finally, uh, we talked a lot about this on Still Untitled, but the Oscars, the Academy Awards, um, the, the Academy of Motion Pictures and Sciences uh, announced last week that they would be creating a new category uh, to be alongside Best Picture, and it's a uh, achievement in popular film. Wait a minute. Along- without, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, without a criteria. Um, and so this would not be replacing Best Picture. It would not be, uh, it would probably be s- somewhere in the middle, right? It, it, um, oh, in terms of the announcement? The, the announcements. Oh, I thought when you said alongside, I was like, wow, this is a big award. Well, that's the question. Is, like, is it going to be a prestigious award? Or is it the award that just says, hey, you weren't, we don't think you're best picture. Here's a participatory it, award for getting a lot of people in box office seats. And is that going to go to the highest grossing film? No. See, they haven't announced the criteria. We don't even know what that means. Does it mean that if you're in a, an achievement for popular film, you can't be in Best Picture? Right. <laughs> it's got a, It's more of a consolation prize, isn't it? It totally is a consolation prize. It's, it's a bunch of BS. I guess the ratings have been way down on, yeah. the, on the Academy Awards. I didn't realize that, all the, probably because I haven't been watching it. <laughs> but they're talking about having it be even shorter than they made it last year. Um, and so they're trying to... Do people watch for it. the ceremony or do people watch for just the, to get their checklist done of what movie right. can be put in the Wikipedia page for Best Picture I, for that year? I think people go to see a lot of movies, go to see if their tastes align with the Academy. Well, do you need a, a whole ceremony for that at all? Or just you can do that it, in a but It's fun. There's also the people watching <laughs> aspect. There's just yeah. the celebrity viewing, just the pomp and circumstance so, so of it all. So if that's what people are, if that's what's going to boost ratings, the pomp and circumstance of all, then amplify that. Don't change up your categories. Like, what are people watching for? I'm, I'm really curious. That's a weird category. It, it's, it's a whole, it's a weird institution. We'll see. Well, I'll be curious to see what wins it, and you know what the uh, acceptance speech is like. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. The acceptance speech. Ah, I guess we didn't qualify for best picture, <laughs> but we sure made a lot of money for some other people. Exactly. <laughs> New phones announced. We got the new Samsung Galaxy Note 9. Mm. Okay. This is a phone's phone. Do you want a big screen? This screen is so big, it won't fit in your pocket big. Whoa. It's what? like 6.4 inches, Wait, I it, believe. It's not bigger than the last Note, is no, it? No, it's about it's the same size. Okay. But it is that is so big. Yeah, it's a phablet. And uh, it has the largest battery ever put in one of these. It's larger than any of the other Android flagships oh, at like 4,000, uh, what was it, milliamps, milliamp hours. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they actually didn't do a ton of different stuff. They integrated a lot of stuff that we saw in the S9, like the dual 12 megapixel uh, cameras. They have technically an octa-core. It's two different quad cores um, acting on this. It's edge to edge um, on uh, in terms of the screen, but it still has a chin and a forehead. Uh, but at that size screen, does it matter? Mm-hmm. The resolution is you know gigantic given that that screen. Do you want one? No. Okay. <laughs> so the, because the you can't one hand this phone. Yeah. The, the point of this phone has always been like the big screen and the S Pen, right? They're a stylus. Mm-hmm. This is their really almost like a laptop replacement because at the high end, this phone costs twelve hundred and fifty dollars. And I thought you have eight gigs of RAM and five hundred twelve gigs of storage. That's like a, that's a pretty. I mean, I would say 
that, 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 that's a good laptop 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. But you could do a lot on it. Yeah, I mean, if you were, I mean, you can do a lot of productivity stuff with the with the S Pen. If you were super serious about mm-hmm. mobile games, mm-hmm. this does have a mobile GPU on board. Yeah, you can play Fortnite now. Yeah, and so like you know, with eight gigs of RAM, you can do a lot. But for twelve hundred fifty bucks, that's a lot of money for for that. Heck and yeah. previously, Samsung had a a dock that you could plug in your phones to and basically turn it into almost a, a desktop. And now that's that is built in that software. So. Uh, you can now plug in an adapter and have HDMI output and use it essentially like a, a laptop. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it has the same processor as, essentially the same processor as the S9. So this actually makes me more excited about the S10 than this this phone because this did lots of little tweaks that we'll probably see carry forward to the S10, but then we'll see iterations on the baseline hardware in the S10. And the S10 is not that far away. I'm I'm so curious because over the past couple of generations, Samsung was also the bigger phone. One of the reasons to get the Note was also the Gear VR compatibility, bigger screen, higher density screen. Um, but now that the Go is out, you know, VR enthusiasts don't have that that need to to go for the, the Note uh, or VR developers. Right. And I know they have a huge market for it. It just feels like like they're two their, their launch plan of like the, the galaxy phone and then six months later the note phone um who's waiting for the note and not no, getting they the galaxy? have that niche like hardcore fans of the note but it's, that niche, like it's a that. niche but they this launch event at launch is launching this as if it's just for market relevance it's just for awareness right uh is that niche big enough to to really compete with you know to to warrant a second phone launch six months later mm-hmm Anyone excited about group FaceTime in iOS 12? Actually, yeah, I was. I feel like that's functionality that has a purpose, especially in a conference call world. Yeah, well, certainly Apple's last of the game here. Skype's done it forever. Um, FaceTime, or Google fa- Hangouts, Facebook yeah. does it. Google ha- Hangouts, um, WeChat, th- yeah, like all those other like third-party chat programs, mm-hmm. they do it. Yep. So Apple should join the t- the party. Well, it's been canceled. It's been postponed. Can- yes. It's been postponed. Canceled for launch of it, iOS. 12. It was in all of the betas, like up until uh, this last one uh-huh. when um, they dropped it, and they said, "Well, you know what? It's just not up to what we want it to be." And experience-wise, or uh, back. End. Yeah, don't know. UI or back end. Don't know. But hmm. they did actually pull the last update a few hours after they released it due to performance problems. So uh, it's not just – that's not the problem with FaceTime with face, uh, time groups. Group FaceTime. That's going to be added later this fall now. I'm really curious how they solve that problem of people talking over each other and surfacing which screen yeah. is the dominant screen. 32 participants they're yeah. promising for this. So yeah. That's a lot of management. I don't know how they're going to – handle the bandwidth for that too yeah and render that well well yeah google hangouts does the interesting thing where they actually do a very low res vi- uh, stream for everybody so it really is not much bandwidth and then whoever gets the foreground gets the high bandwidth stream so it's probably something similar i think it's one of those essential features and when you think about p- it's oftentimes you have people wanting to buy tablets or phones uh for their relatives the older generation yeah and one to one FaceTime works, but it's off like this would be a huge selling point for people to get together and, and communicate over the holidays or you know, with with their grandparents. We do that all the time. But we're around one screen. Exactly. And there's something cool about that's like huddled. You but know? then it's just one to one. You're talking about one household. No, 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 no like we get a whole family in front of the camera. Right, right, but that's know? still one household to one yes, household. Yes. And there are big families out there. Oh, who I all want to... That's true. But now I'm thinking with group FaceTime, my whole family might actually do the same thing, but we'll all be on our own devices. Oh, you know. you're, you're afraid that's going to s- split that up. I don't you know. know. Will that be weird? Will there be echoes around the room? I don't know. We'll find out. Huh. <laughs> someone's on the couch. Someone's in, at the, the kitchen counter. Exactly. All on their phones. We're all, all on, on the, the couch. Same. All on the couch, like with our own devices. I don't want to talk to you unless you have a... An emoji. <laughs> I only want to talk to your an emoji. I'm actually... That's actually more exciting to me. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, th- something just launching on Apple TV. Do you guys care about this? Do people, people still care about HQ? That's why I put it in here. It's basically... <laughs> it's HQ trivia has on, been on a slow decline. They're bleeding users on a regular basis. How many people play now? 
Do you know? I, I don't know. Okay. I haven't because it's like a million a for a while. You, do, you yeah. just turn off your your daily notification. I still get them. I just don't play. Oh, that's you got to turn off the notification. I do. I well, you I can't uninstall be it. What are you talking about? That's how you get rid of the notification. Yeah, no, that's what I need to do. Uh, but they are porting to Apple TV, and I'm wondering. I, I only put this in there less about HQ trivia, but more about the idea of can apps have a second life if they migrate to those OTT sets. And I I don't know of any apps that have done that really successfully that mm-hmm. have made that transition outside of like core ones like YouTube or something like that. Uh, but I'm wondering something like HQ Trivia, which it is something that you like. It's a game show. It's meant to be on a TV. Yeah. In a lot of ways. Yeah. Is there a second life? Is this where like no dude. Fortnite goes? Is, is a, this where it's a blip? There's gonna be a little little uptick. This is not a second life. This is not for HQ trivia. Okay. Like we can all agree for that. Yeah. I mean, but the for other of, types of apps, the yeah. appeal of that was the immediacy of wherever you were, you could dial in, and you don't have the appointment was with you, not with the the technology in the room. But it's, this is but this is not exclusive to the phone. Like you sure, could, either or. If you're at home at six o'clock, and you're on your TV, there it's an option. So this what 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 it needs though, and I don't know if Apple TV has this built in, is the ability to interrupt. And Comcast definitely has this ability to have the notification pop up all, while you're. The assumption is that you're already going to be on your Apple TV. Mm. Right? Maybe it's an appointment based thing. Maybe this is the time you all gather together around your TV, turn on the Apple TV, and switch that app. But it needs to be, even if you're in the Netflix app, even if you're just watching something on iTunes, yeah. the notification pops up and says HQ's coming on mm-hmm. at 6 p.m. or whatever Apple competitor. It would on your right? phone. Right, exactly. And then you pause and you switch over. And then for those next 20 minutes, you see Scott and. Make make or lose that money or not win that money. Probably not. And then and then uh, and then switch back. Yep. Right. Pause the Netflix. Yeah. This is this is right for something for. A- I don't think Apple's going to allow HQ to do this. But oh, if Apple was I'm to surprised it doesn't do it. Launch a competitor. It, it, it's something that makes sense for them to do. Yep. Um. Another way to get you to turn on to, to yours uh, a specific company's service. Yes. Is well, NBC. Uh, th- this comes from the information. NBC Universal has is messing with an idea, toying with an idea, flirting to reward viewers for watching online videos using their service. Oh, people love rewards. Love rewards. S- Gift certificates. <laughs> Watch a certain number of shows. Re- like money. Yes. Oh wow, that's for real. Paying people. That's not a skin. No. Yeah, but yeah. there's a catch. Which shows? Do I well, have to watch? it turns out, according to the information, this is not a, a launch um, a promotion yet. Uh, it would be for NBC Universal's shows and other shows, also from other sources. If it's Will and Grace, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Answer trivia. I, I have been watching uh, Amy Poehler's uh, Making It show with, oh. uh, what's his name? Ron Swanson, that guy. Uh-huh. Oh. Uh, they have Nick like Offerman. A, Nick Offerman. They have a, a weekly show where uh, contestants have to build stuff. Well, that's great. Yeah, it's actually it's actually pretty enjoyable. It's a reality show. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, it's it's very much like what you win is the actual process of making something. Yeah. I mean, this is it's very lighthearted. This is like the old school days of Net Zero or uh, or what were those services where uh, you get you get free web surfing as long as you have the banner ad on right. the bottom of the screen, or the car payments if you wrap your car in an advertisement. Yeah, that's right. You get you get pay. I, I have friends in high school who did that. You wrap their car in Chips Ahoy banners and become an advertisement. Yeah. Or you know, they they may have it so you answer a quiz about which ads you saw, and then you get gift certificates for those companies or discounts for those companies. I predict success. And people love getting free stuff. Oh, they really do. Yeah, and they'll and they they, they, they love the. They're okay with watching ads because they think they're not paying for it, and yet they are because they're explicitly getting gift certificates to buy more things yep. from those companies. And yeah, it makes the world go round. Um, and Chuck E. Cheese, it makes Chuck E. Cheese go round too. <laughs> yeah, all yeah. those redemption games, all all those all those tickets. Mm-hmm. I need all those tickets. Put more <laughs> money in so I can get the thing that I could have bought for a fraction of that money in the first place. But I got the endorphins. <laughs> exactly. The, the, the endorphins. You're paying for the endorphins, really. Uh, Fortnite, biggest video game in the world. Yeah, so it launched on Android last week. It had some exclusive to a, uh, to Samsung for a little while. And, and, and not on the Google Play Store. Yeah, they specifically cut out Google Play so they could have that 30% you know uh, cut that Google usually takes. 
And I, I think Google kind of shot back because if oh. you search for it yeah. in the Play Store, it's like item is not available. Like they use, I don't know if that's language that's, you know, different versus other apps, but it makes it sound like it doesn't exist. I li- I think that's nice because they could have put some third party thing up there and that was maybe yeah. even posing as the game. But so we expected a smash success and while it's gotten a ton of downloads, uh reports have been that the uh, performance has been bad. Uh and it's it uh the Unreal Engine especially has been very sloppy in terms of performance on Android. Mm. And so uh users are are having a very negative experience so far and so there are a lot of tweaks that have to come about before people have a, a good time especially when compared to Fortnite on um other I, mobile devices what do you mean you mean apple devices yeah yeah uh is there a particular phone that it works well on or just across all Android? no no it's been it bad. seems to be across all androids huh. i mean there most of the things were on uh were reported on samsung s9 so we're not talking New about stuff. like yeah wow. we're not talking about old phones hmm. Okay, so we'll see how long till fix. But if this continues to be an issue, maybe this is going to see uh, have some lingering effects for Fortnite Android users. All right, uh, on to some video game news. Uh, Discord, the chat service and communications program that we often use it's, for yeah, it's for, like uh, Slack for video games. Yeah, or Ventrilo. Yeah, or does Roger Wilco. It would yeah. free group voice chats. Yes, yeah. and and communication channels. Uh, they may be selling games soon. Change up some of the business. What do you think Expanding. about that? So they're basically a Steam competitor, but uh, um, you know they're a little bit more choosy about what games go on their network because the, the the developers may support their their communities better. Yeah. What? So what is the what is the draw? Why would I buy a game on Discord when I could buy it on Steam and just use Discord? Because then you only have one thing to launch: better integration. Okay. I mean, it, it's it's kind of a no brainer if you're already if you're building a service that already is providing something essentially a lot of people use for free and they rely on it and they have a community there, this extra income and potential for integration is kind of a no-brainer. I also like they can target specific communities then to do promotions. Yep. Uh, that's something that Steam, I don't think, really does. Because what better way to get people excited about um, about a DLC or an expansion and get people to shift their communities to play a game for a short period that's the, I mean, it's it's eyeballs. It's the thing that Steam maybe doesn't do so well is that Steam community. Oh, very much so. The, yeah. it, it's, the functionality is there. The friends list is there. But Discord is hugely successful because it's all about community. Yeah. And so when you can get people to buy games together and get that, that network effect. There's a lot of game developers who run their official community on Discord. Yeah. You know, they, they don't say come to our forums anymore or come to our subreddit. They, they say, here's an invite to our Discord channel. And it saved them a lot of development costs in terms of running forums. And it changed the whole idea of community management because they just run Discord. You know, it's, they're beholden to Discord as a service and trust Discord. That Discord will give them all they need and they won't just erase everything. Um, it also, though, opens Discord up to having to run the services of a store. Yeah. Refunds, customer support, and they have to weigh those costs. And I'm sure they have. And it may make sense. What I think is interesting is there's also a subscription model that Discord has put out where they'll curate a set of games. So it's something like $5 a month or something. Right. And I kind of, I think that's, I mean, that has never really taken off in the, in video game land. That's been one of those, like, you know, nuts. Everyone wants a crack. What Are these free games? List. These are free games that everyone who pays the subscription fee gets every month? Mm-hmm. Well, PlayStation does that, right? Same kind of thing. Yeah, but um, has that been successful, quote unquote? Well, I don't, I don't know. know if it's a reason. Why a lot of people, people have tried around. it. Yeah, uh, I wonder if their curation will actually lead to more people trying games because, I mean, early if this is a version of early access, like and how successful that's been for Steam. Yeah, uh, I, I think it could work. If there was a little more bad will towards Steam, I think this would be huge. But Steam is so beloved still, and, and people are kind of held ransom. By it. Like their games are locked there. In what way? I don't think Steam has any exclusivity. No, but your old games. Oh, right. right. You kind of have to keep Steam installed because that's where all your purchases exactly. are. Exactly. It's not like your phone number where you can switch from AT and T to Verizon and, yeah. and move the license over. Imagine if that was a possibility. It, it Steam's. I think we talked about it last week. Their UI is so antiquated. Like they really could use a refresh. Obviously, they have the big screen version, but the desktop mode is. Oh, it just feels uh, ten years old. And Discord has an opportunity to make something fresh. Yeah. Uh, there was a QuakeCon last week as well. 
That's still a thing. I've never been to a <laughs> Quake Con. Of course, it's still a thing. It's a huge thing. And, and that, that to me is surprising with the growth of like games like Fortnite and PUBG. Oh, but they're all and, there. And yeah, they're all. They still all go to this one other place. To it's hang a land party. It's the land party. Right, and and Quake is and Doom specifically more relevant these past couple of years. But there was a time when those franchises were not. Yeah. There was not a lot there, and Bethesda. This essentially becomes Bethesda's own kind of launch event. And it things. is a Bethesda thing now, whereas it, it used to really be id. You know, it used to right. have Carmax uh, keynote. It, they're all the same now. Id, id, and, id and Bethesda exactly. is one of the same. Yeah, you've got they're, Pete Hines up there as the just, MC. Yeah, it, it's just uh, uh, Pete Willis or uh, Tim Willis is you know level designer, creative director, and he, he's the one who who opens the whole thing up. The last remaining id guy. Uh, core it guy. Well, they announced a new Doom, Doom Eternal. Doom Eternal. Well, they announced it at E3, but we we Showed got to see a lot of game footage. Fifteen minutes of footage. It was it was. Yeah. You want to see a clip? Oh, cheers, cheers, cheers. Yeah. How about another, How about another clip? one? <laughs> and then another one. I will say, I I didn't. I I really liked that they showed one mouse and keyboard clip, because that's usually a little too jarring. The gamepad controls lend themselves to smoother camera movements. So they'll, oh. they'll do well, they, that. Well, they copy it. You want some faster stuff? Who's your mouse exactly, and keyboard fan? Exactly. All right. Here's some mouse and keyboard footage. And and that footage was the most exciting to me. Because it's fast paced. Because you really got a feel for how that game could play. And they've added a lot of verticality and grappling to the game. So now you have a grapple hook that flies out. You can grab onto enemies in the sky and then fly up over top of them, like let go and swoop, like parabola-wise. Yeah. Uh, you think that's going to make its way so over to a VR? Do you think they're, they're making this with oh some God. VR in mind? Because the grapple know. stuff could work very well in VR. Uh, you uh, well, could also make you throw up real well in VR. I don't know. They, they were pretty cautious with the Doom VR game in uh, in the in terms of the actual camera movement, the right. ver- the vertical camera movement. Right. Right. So I don't know. I don't know. I'd love to. I'd love to see what they can pull off. But Doom Eternal looks uh, looks fun. It's more. It's like the last Doom game amped up. Are you? So they they opened this with saying this is ID Tech Seven. Yeah. Does that mean anything to you anymore? Well, it's weird that they're continuing that code base without Carmack, to me, just because, it, to yeah. me, that is his. It's, it like someone, it's like someone writing, finishing a book. It's like the next version of the Bible. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's the New yeah, Testament. Exactly. But wait a minute. But I don't Who need, is writing this I don't version? need Lucas writing my Bible anymore. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that to me is, uh, sure, it's, it's their rights and their, their prerogative, their tech. Uh, but sure. when they just say in Tech 7 and they say 10 times as many polygons, it really doesn't mean anything no. to me. Not in the same way when Carmack announced a new tech engine he had made. Yeah, like it was something different. I was I was surprised that they're not transitioning to one engine across Bethesda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sixty FPS. This will work. You know, one forty four FPS also is pretty cool. <laughs> Maybe that works for some games as well. Um, Speaking of other games, another convention, DEF CON was this past weekend. Now, there are a bunch of reports out of DEF CON, the scary stuff uh, with polling machines being easily hacked, uh, lots of demos there. But in terms of the fun things at DEF CON, uh, the badge itself was was something of a, a, a of a really awesome thing. This Wait, is a, Everybody got this? Everyone got this. It's a PCB and uh, has power, has LEDs, uh, and it turned out, it was like an adventure game. <gasps> Stop it. Text adventure. Oh, my God. What is this? Why, why are the LEDs facing that way? I want to see the, this more carefully. This is cool because there's a PCB with LEDs on the back side. Yes. Normally, you would surface mount those facing out, but these appear to be facing in towards the circuit board so that they illuminate the other side of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, apparently, you could. there are some screenshots on Ars Technica of the text adventure that you would get uh, when you plugged it in and... Uh, what do you mean text adventure? So uh, you can connect it to a computer uh-huh. and you can access the game screen using the terminal. Oh. And, with putty and windows. Oh, cool. And there's like there's actually adventure there. Adventure game built into the badge. Well, I'm a big fan of that. Yeah. Nice, nicely done. Yeah. Still, I'd never, I never want to go to DEF CON. I would not be adequately prepared to go. Patrick Norton goes. I want to hear what he had to say. Yeah. About it. Uh, and finally, with some uh, car news, got to wrap up on some self-driving car news. Uh, let's not talk about n- no Tesla talk this week, uh, but Uber. Uber has, uh, has been investing a bunch of money in self-driving car efforts. Mm-hmm. And investors uh, are now pushing for Uber to shut down that initiative. They've been spending, well, because of one, the accidents they've had, the the the, uh, the problems with their self-driving car, the, the, uh, the fatalities. And also, it's just costing a lot of money. It's been costing 
How much do you think Uber's self-driving car experiment is costing? Um, $100 million a year. More, How about I'd say more. $100 to $2 million a quarter? Oh, so five times or four times what I said. Oh, good. Okay, that's a billion dollar a year almost cost right there. Isn't that insane? You know, it's hard to it's hard to weigh the you know the what the the pros of it like the the return on it uh, could possibly be very high. The future of roads. Yeah. You know, you know there's some uh, some reports uh, out of Apple that Apple may be continuing Project Titan, which is their their long rumored car initiative. Yeah. Uh, they had really strongly telegraphed this. Remember that interview with Johnny Ive where he was like touching a car. Like, no. like, oh, cars, cars are ripe for reinvention. Yeah. Um, and then nothing came out of it. Um, apparently, he was a huge passion project of his. They had hired a Bob Mansfield, uh, who did all the chip stuff for, for the iPhone, uh, to head up the design. And then uh, one of the Tesla executives who had uh, been put on leave or had put himself on leave, quit Tesla or left Tesla, is now back at Apple working in that division. There you go. So don't count them out. Uber has some pretty talented people working on this, so I imagine if they actually do put it up for sale, it'll be bought quickly just for the talent acquisition. They've all got talented people. Tesla, Apple, Uber. Go- it's a question of can you, can you own that? Like, what are they racing to? Oh, I don't understand the business case for Uber. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, do you, do you want to be first to market or do you not? I don't know. Apple's never first to market, except I guess with the iPhone they kind of were. But normally they, they, they just... they're not first to market in that way. They weren't they weren't the first ones with the digital uh, the, uh, a screen or internet on their phones. They're first to market with a highly responsive, uh, capacitive, yes, not resistive screen with a screen that you could actually pull up a full web page yeah. on. Yeah, they weren't the first MP3 player. They weren't the yeah. first smartwatch. They tend to come out with a thought out product, and, I, they, I and they won't be the first AR device. No. Yeah. And they, they may never be have a VR device at all. Uh, the car stuff is really scary because I think all companies are still figuring out, figuring out regulation. And the, 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 the risks here are monumental. Uh, and obviously, Tesla has a huge lead in that market, uh, at least in the U.S. And Tesla does operate overseas. In China, there are like 100 electric car companies vying for a spot there because there are so many people. Wow. It is a problem that needs to be solved because of just gas consumption and and smog. Uh, but over the next five to 10 years, it's going to take, it, it's going to whittle down to, you know, four companies that will survive, four or five companies out of those hundred. But there's a lot, there's millions being put in there. Uh, I was talking to someone over the weekend and they're saying take the time it takes typically to, if you want to start an electric car company to get a car to market, maybe using not comp- all original parts, like four years, but you could do it. That seems like not, no time at all. But electric cars and self-driving cars are two totally different problems. They are intertwined. I, sp- I mean, they're I not abs- really. I mean, but you have all kinds of electric cars that have no self-driving capabilities. My car doesn't even have adaptive cruise control. I don't think, but I don't think you're going to have self-driving without electric. Oh, maybe, maybe not. I mean, are the Waymo cars uh, electric? Because they're the ones who are doing it driverless. Not, a lot of them are Priuses. Um, I, I, all I want is, is fa- a fast charging network, uh, down the five. I want to be able to charge anywhere fast charging. The regulations, you know, I mean, the physics don't. You think the regulations are bad on fast charging? Just wait till we talk about self-driving. So yeah, that's why I think we're, we're so far away no. and that's why you, Uber can't sustain this. Mm. And I think that does it for technology news this week. Before we move on to our next segment, I want to thank the sponsor of this week's episode of This is Only a Test. And that is... Evident. Evident is revolutionizing the way personal data is shared. Evident provides a simple, secure platform that lets businesses confidently know who they are dealing with without handling sensitive personal data. With connections to thousands of authoritative sources through a single API, Evident is the only platform that enables comprehensive, accurate, and up-to-date identity and credential verifications. And companies can create a solid foundation of trust and safety on their platform, allowing them to seamlessly verify workers in less time and with more Confident. Evident is bringing confidence and peace of mind personal data interactions across the globe from identity verifications to background checks and everything in between. Businesses of all sizes can get the answers they need with Evident. Check it out at evidentid.com slash test and sign up and get started immediately. Again, that's E-V-I-D-E-N-T-I-D, evidentid.com slash test to sign up and thank them for supporting this episode. for 
moment of science. I was remiss not talking about this last week, but one of the more amazing space launches happened over the weekend in the wee hours of Sunday morning. The Parker Solar Probe launched aboard the Delta IV Heavy Rocket. It's a $1.5 billion project to send a probe into the corona of the sun, that invisible part of the sun that we only see when there's eclipses happening. This is an amazing project that is essentially going to put this probe into orbit around the sun over the next seven years. Its first sort of orbital approach, which is still going to be very far away, happens in November. It's going to get sort of a gravity assist from from Venus first. But before it gets there, it's going to be still really far away. But what's interesting is like, you know, the sun is this really dynamic environment. It has all of these fluxes in its uh and it's magnetic um, uh, forces and shields that lead to all of these eruptions on the surface. And while we've gotten a lot of pictures from that, from uh, solar probes in in orbit around the Earth, we've never really gone to into the corona, the atmosphere of the sun like this. And so a lot of the orbits are essentially, I guess it's weird to call it geosynchronous because it's the sun, <laughs> but um, it, it'll be synchronous orbit, so we'll get pictures of the same spot over uh, many, many days. So they're actually going to be spinning up the probe as it approaches the sun on some of these orbits to match the spin of the sun's speed. Um, so it'll be in that sort of synchronous orbit and get pictures of a of the same spot over time. Uh, it also is going to get as close as any other probe has ever gotten to the sun. And the corona can get up to millions of degrees. It's not going to get to the parts of the corona that are at that temperatures. How can anything we have made on Earth survive those temperatures? I I don't have a good answer. For you. <laughs> I seen mean, the movie Sunshine was not yeah, well, right, right. <laughs> just tinted windows. That's all you need, right? So, anyways, it uh, you know it, it's going to be a while before we see this. It's five years until it actually enters the corona but this is just one of those fascinating projects plus it launched on the delta four heavy which is the yeah which is an interesting launch vehicle to look at um i'll post more links to more interesting analysis of the of the launch too but i also um there's some great pictures because the perseids were peaking that same night um the meteor shower so like there's pictures of I saw a picture of somebody showing like a meteor streaking through the sky as the Delta Four is like, oh, wow. heading into skies. So that's, that's great, cool. Uh, we got our first pictures of the Dragon capsule interior this week mm. um, because the newly announced astronauts, which I talked about last week, did sort of like a press tour mm -hmm. um, at SpaceX. Is it Stark and Barron and only one seventeen-inch screen? Uh, pretty pretty close to that, I would say. It is pretty Stark and um, Barron. There isn't much, but we're used to, especially, you know, being around Adam. Adam is a, a fan of the old capsules yeah. and space history. So everything switches. with all the switches everywhere. This is the opposite of that. It's very streamlined, just a few screens, you know, simple uh, tablet interface. Um, oh, is this it? Yeah, it actually looks quite comfortable, which is odd to me. Oh, wow. Because that's the, the word I would never associate to space travel. Is comfort's comfortable. last priority. Yeah, exactly. So, and y you were you heard Chris talking about the Soyuz capsules, yeah. what they are like. He does not speak of them in high regard to ergonomics. Mm. Let's just say yes. Uh, but anyways, those pictures I think are really interesting. They remind me more of 2001 than they do of anything we've seen recently. Though 2001 still had a lot of switches. Um, That's cool. One thing that I thought was interesting that kind of flew under the radar uh, with all the deplatforming talk this week about Alex Jones and other stuff, YouTube quietly um, implemented something they had talked about a while ago, which is if you're watching videos on climate change, information from trusted sources about what we know from a science perspective about climate change mm -hmm. will pop up underneath the video. This is sort of that Wikipedia integration they talked about. And so this started to emerge on videos that either talked about climate change denial or even about climate change science. They didn't make sort of a distinction between the two. Uh, what I think is sort of fascinating about this is sort of twofold. Like one, that this kind of came out without a lot of fanfare. Two, uh, all the evidence about what it takes to actually change people's minds or, or um, shift people's opinion if they have a strongly held view on this. Uh, 
says that this won't work um, and in fact can harden people's views to have uh, information like this presented in this factual way that's not moderated by any human individual. Um, but it's still a nice thing to see. Like uh, somewhere inside of me, I'm still like, yeah, this feels like the right thing to do. Dude, I feel like someone's got to fight to educate our society. And if it's not going to be government, it's got to be corporations. I don't know. Do you feel weird Ooh. about it, though? Hey. Yeah, I do. You feel Yeah, I what? feel a little weird about this, Really? Too. I don't know. I feel like we're going down a dangerous path. I don't know. Like, uh, but, you know, and we got to grasp at some solutions. I understand the argument of like the platform has a responsibility, the kinds of content that's on their platform. But do they have a responsibility to talk about the content that's on the platform? That feels weird to me. Editorializing? Yeah, because like, what if I, I, I it's hate It's not sli- editorializing. I hate slippery It's slip. not an opinion. I hate slippery slope comments, but here, here's one. Like, what if, like, we're watching Adam do a Nerf build, and then YouTube is inserting information about Nerf balls and Nerf guns and the danger of them yeah. it, at the bottom of that video? That Like, there's some intrusion factor there. I liked pop-up video on VH1. <laughs> I, I really thought that was actually a, a pretty entertaining show. Um, I, You know what? The Nerf analogy doesn't work as well for me and i'm sure yeah there's less at stake i was trying to come up <laughs> with a like, less like what is the most uh, like the earth is not at stake yeah i was trying to think of like what's untested that i could bring up and that was just the first video that popped in my you head you know not doing anything is is akin to you know mark zuckerberg like backing away from holocaust deniers and saying well they they got it wrong but what what can we do about it i think that that there's we're reaching a point where we have to do something about it i think it's it's more it's remove them from the platform if you're going to make a choice like that Let's take them off the platform. Hmm. Uh, lastly, and this is a big news story that, again, is a little under the radar, is that uh, a jury awarded a $300 million award um, for against Monsanto uh, related to its weed killer Roundup for having uh, contributed to uh, cancer cases. And this case was actually brought by a groundskeeper here in San Francisco. Uh, and why it's important is like, the uh, carcinogen properties of glyphosate, which is the ingredient in Roundup, this weed killer is probably the most commonly used herbicide in the country, both from uh, industrial agriculture farms down to individuals just kind of spraying this in their in their lawns. Uh, it's been very much disputed by industry versus some of the scientific trials what's come out. Um, but uh, there is, A lot of the meta studies say that there is no strong evidence linking glyphosate uh, glyphosate, uh, to cancer, but there are some studies on a very localized basis that indicate that it does have some interactions with other chemicals that do contribute to cancer. So I think this is an interesting ruling because it's a place where the science is a little murky, uh, at least from my perspective, from what I've read. Um, And... Uh, the exposure in in this person's case, it's hard, very hard to assess if that exposure would have led to any sort of cancer diagnosis to begin with, because they weren't significant in the way that we had. Ex- they weren't repetitive over time in a way that we had expected to uh, to lead to that. Uh, this is a huge disaster for Monsanto. So we'll see where all of this goes. <laughs> The VR Minute, virtual reality this week. All right, so we talked about AR a bunch at the top of the show. Let's talk about VR a little bit. You did some VR. You're, you're wearing this shirt. Do you know this says something? It looks like a maze, but it says something. What? It says step beyond reality. Oh, boy. Yeah, now you got to look for it. That's really cool. It's in there. So I went to see the void... I forget what they call it. It's like Shadows of the Empire or something mm-hmm. like that. It's Secrets of the Empire. It's a Star Wars themed void experience. Now yep. we all we all know and, and most of our listeners know about the void. They started in Salt Lake City. They do a location based VR experience using a lot of their own technology. Uh, they've opened up a Ghostbusters experience, I think, in New York. Yep. And uh, in Vegas. This is their first experience in Anaheim. And it's of course Disney themed. It's on Disney property. Uh, so you have done this. I have done this. And this I, is in downtown Disney, not in Disneyland proper. $30 yeah. a ticket. And the experience is about 20 minutes, but they say give yourself an hour. You have to go through a sign-up process. It's four people per group. It's only, uh, let's be clear, the experience is at most 20 minutes, yeah. and that's including the briefing. It's oh. more like 
15 minutes. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah, it's about 15 minutes. Um, but the, the, so you go in, you sign your life away on their little uh, digital screens, and then yep. they, they call out your name, a rebel Jeremy. Yes, and I raise my hand, and they put a wristband on you. Then you walk through. Of course, they say no cameras of any kind. Yep, no cameras. Nothing at all. No photos, no video. They want all this proprietary stuff to remain secret. So you go in, you, you're presented with a large display where Cassian from Rogue, Cassian o- Rogue One, right? Rogue One. Uh, shows up, and he tells you about how. Um, you have to infiltrate this rebel base disguised as a stormtrooper. Yep. You have to find this box, find out what's in it, and get out alive. Yeah. So you have uh, you and your three friends or strangers. In my case, we actually had four people, so it's perfect. My, oh, my, my your whole son, family did it. No, my son, and we had two friends who live ah, in L.A. Okay. They came with us. Um, had an absolute blast. This was the highlight of my trip to Disneyland. Wow. Um, you put on the backpack? 15 minutes or whatever. Yeah, so you go into the set- setup room. It's all very clean, very high-tech. There's, Lockers. There's a little crane that's holding your backpack yeah. up for you. You put it on. You put all the straps on. It's, you put the helmet on, and the helmet is a VR headset that's mounted to a larger piece of gear. It's an Oculus headset. It, it, it is inside because they actually have the Oculus logo in the room. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, But the earphones are like over-the-ear, big old fancy yeah. studio earphones, and it's all custom the, custom yeah. shell. On the front of the goggles is a leap motion. Yeah. So you, um, there's hand tracking. So you can reach out and you can see your hands. As soon as you put the thing on, um, well, they lead you to the room. Uh, you, then they say, okay, good luck. They close the door, whatever. You put the headset on. You can see all the other stormtroopers standing around you. You can see their hands moving. You can reach out. You can high five one another. That, that was a big deal for them because there, there's a lot of, yeah. lot of location-based experiences don't have hand tracking right and it's a thing that in their r&d uh they decided very importantly that for a lot of people whose first time is in vr uh hand tracking and not with a controller hand tracking hand presence Mm -hmm. with hand tracking uh was going to be a huge part of the presence that it wasn't just good enough to see yourself in that space and see your feet you actually need to have your hands represented the fact that you can reach out and high five your friends is is cool yeah it's not great everyone who's used sleep motion knows that there's a field of view and once your hands leave it uh they just fall to your side. Spaghetti. It does. They don't know what your hands are doing, but you forgive it. It's enough. Um, anyway, so then the the door, the room dissolves from a uh, generic grid that looks a little bit like the pattern on my shirt to uh, a door, and then in the reality, that door opens and you walk through it. And so uh, we made my son go first. <laughs> it turns out that freaked him out. So from then on, we all went first. But you go into another room and you can feel the doorway as you go through, and you're walking, and then you enter a room that has a bench in it. If you're in a shuttle. It's a space bench. And then, yeah, you're in a shuttle. So then you, you can all sit down on the bench. And that's, that's the point of the void experiences is you can see virtual reality and you can use it. You can reach out mm-hmm. and feel it and engage with it. Vibrating floors, wind fans being blown at you. Did you see K2SO in the room? Yeah, of course. Did you try to feel K2SO? No. He see that? He's there. I, I reached out and felt the R2 unit at the end. Yeah, there's an actual <laughs> K2SO static you, unit there. Did you peek at all? Did you take off the headset to see what the what mm. was happening oh, in the real world? Like, did I like mentally peek? Um, n- no, I didn't. No, I didn't. Oh. I didn't. And maybe like I should have, but I was so immersed in. Come this. on, Jeremy. I know. As an editor, as a what ju- kind of VR journalist, journalist are you? I, I I don't know. I don't know. If I did it again, I might be more interested in that. Yeah. But I was so into this experience. You you go out onto this moving platform. You fly above. What is it, Mustafar? It's like mm-hmm. some lava planet. Uh, you can feel the heat like it's beaming up at you and mm-hmm. then you go uh, and you rise and like you're nervous you're going to fall off and you walk through this other doorway you find weapons and when we found the weapons a rack like, of weapons everyone was like oh look guys weapons and you reach out you can actually take them you feel them the trigger of course my 11 year old as soon as he got it in his hand started shooting you blasting everything in sight oh my god yeah. that and now you're supposed to be playing this as a stealth mission Oops. So you hear them say, what was that? Blast him. And so, and you hear like K2SO over the over your comm say, well, so much for stealth. And then you're, you're shooting all the stormtroopers. You're like running. You're running down the hallway. Well, well scripted. You're not supposed to be running. Walking <laughs> briskly. You're walking yeah. briskly through the hallway. And then uh, you're out on this other platform where these aliens come up from the lava. These lava beasts try to kill you and you have to shoot their blast from the air. You know how ridiculous it looks when you're not in when you're watching someone do this though because i peeked of course under, it does. What, and there's nothing there's no expanse of lava it's just a wall right well, there like everyone's just pointing at the wall <laughs> great 
great. No, no, and that's that's, that's the illusion. Awesome. It's the illusion. And so then, the like, weapons are tracked then. Yes, yes. weapons are tracked. And yeah. and they're they have uh, haptics and the triggers. Yeah. They have two triggers on them. They're uh, not real. N- not real stormtrooper weapons. Stop it's it. Stop, don't blow. Don't blow my illusion. <laughs> so then my friend got hit. Um, oh and, no. And she like you feel the vibrations when yeah. you get hit by laser. You're, you're, you're also wearing a uh, a vest. And she kind of role played it, so she fell down. <laughs> she's wow. like, uh, she's like, I'm down. I think I died. And then so like I see the stormtrooper laying on the ground, and but there's so many other bad guys around us. That shoot. I I say so I can't help you right now. And I was taking out all these other stormtroopers. Anyway, you know, like I don't, I don't I guess I don't want to ruin the ending, but there's a good crescendo. So did you get to the point where you have to press the buttons? Yes, and there's there's two options like like there's yeah. two panels. Yeah, and I think if you can play it differently. I talked to the to the uh, guys who run the the show afterwards. Mm-hmm. And they said, yeah, you can play it stealth. You can go through the whole mission without having a firefight. Mm. Which was like, what? Really? Yeah, it's a good, it's, it's game development, right? It's a game design. So but they, think about that. When you, they had the buttons, everyone is, of course, linked up for player multiplayer yeah. uh, with the software. But not only are you linked up, to, but the buttons in the real world are linked up to your software wirelessly. Mm-hmm. So the buttons that you're pressing actually do something to the game that you're 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 playing. It's like a like VR control. escape room that mashed up together. Yeah. And I I just had a blast. Did I'd love I'd love to do it again and play it stealth. Did you uh, feel the backtracking? Did you try, did you try to break the sense of space? Like oh I'm, I gotta go back because I know this room isn't like that. For big. the rest of the day, I was reviewing it in my head and I was like, well wait a minute, how I know I they use the same space twice because yeah. we changed elevations or environments and it's supposed to feel different. Right. But as I thought about it, yeah, we did maybe like a triangle. Yeah. And I would love to, to get a hands on making of kind of sense. Of it's it. a, it's a wonderful VR experience. And it, the, the amazing thing is, uh, for people who, for their, it being their first VR experience, they completely buy in. Oh yeah. For some people it's, they're there because it's Star Wars. The people, the three people I played it with had no VR experience hmm. and they were there because they heard it was a Star Wars ride like thing. Yeah. And they loved it and they loved it because it, they didn't have to think about the tech. They weren't trying to break the tech. They weren't, they were just yeah. fully immersed. Mm-hmm. They were stormtroopers. They got the fire blasters. They got to, you know, you don't have to use the force, but you get to see your hands. Like you have to be in that world mm-hmm. in a way that no other ride. And this is, the, I, I think we talked about this in projections. This like, feels like the future of Disney rides. Yeah. Like, of of di- amusement park rides you know, are these type of experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's expensive gear. And I, I wonder if, and there's a bit of time it takes to suit yeah. up, to get the instructions. And to, I, that's all intentional because the, there's only so much physical space. It's the churn time. But the onboarding process takes time, and that's something that Disney loves to to manage. And so, like, well, I think they did it intentionally because there can only be so many groups in that room at the same time, yeah. and they have to pace that, yeah, right. So, but like, I, how do you scale that to a park? Is what I'm saying. How you do, have to a rooms. park ride. You got to have like five of those rooms. It's the same thing as what we anticipate for the Millennium Falcon. I how wonder. many cockpits of the Millennium Falcon? They do want you have, but they want to put they you want, on the car as soon as you're there. I don't know how you scale that. More cars, I guess. More cars, more rooms. Yeah, more headsets. It, it it was great. I'm really glad to have finally done it. Um, I want to do more void stuff. Yeah. It. Th- I would love to have to do something with bigger, with more space. Like that's the one thing. Maybe there's 15 square feet you end up using. Maybe 20. It's not that much. Uh, and so I would love to do something with a larger space. Like like we did with the the location based guys up in uh, Marin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh. W- yeah. So that was my VR experience. Uh, we have a new VR headset announced this week. This is Star VR's final, their wide FOV headset, 210 degrees. They're saying it's as wide as your FOV. Uh, near, near. Near human FOV. Yeah, so this is called the Star VR 1. It is still a developer kit, they're, they're saying. Mm-hmm. Uh, has Steam VR 2.0 tracking. They're saying nearly 100% natural human vision. That's, that's interesting. It's compelling. I mean, there are problems that come with that. Like, how do you warp the world? At the, the, the lenses, those extreme angles can be kind of kind of weird. Two hundred degrees horizontal, one hundred thirty degrees vertical. So they're really talking about the Y, the horizontal field yeah. of view, uh, and uh, the the lenses are um, two sets of eighteen thirty by fourteen sixty four. So kind of a weird. Yeah, it's uh, weird. It's slightly better than Vive Pro, but given the FOV, the pixel density is not that great. Mm-hmm. It's more about wide FOV. And then uh, they have built in some technologies that will help developers experiment with future te- technologies like uh, Toby eye tracking. So if you want to work in foveated rendering, this is one way to do it. Yep. Uh, and um, wired connection needs a good GPU. Fine. Uh, if you want that resolution. And uh, it will have 
uh, 90 FPS. Previously, uh, we thought it would be have a lower uh, uh, 60, but it's it will. Yeah. I don't know if this is this. This doesn't sound like it's a consumer thing. Um, mm-hmm. I'm sure it adapts well to Steam VR games. Uh, and Are you? System. Because the the Pimax really didn't like. I didn't yeah. like the distortion at the extreme. Um, peripheral view in, the, in that headset. Mm-hmm. I'll be curious to see how Steam games are adapted to this, what their drivers do to it. Yeah, uh, it is RGB stripe, so high pixel fill, and um, we'll be, yeah, I, I don't know if we'll have a chance to use this, but it's another dev kit. It's not a real, it's yeah. not, not something for you and me, not, not something for necessary for you out there. Um, we saw this years ago, back at E3, when they, and they, they had a, uh, a Walking Dead demo mm-hmm. that used the wide field of view, and yeah, it's good. It's not game changing. I think mm. people who are going to use it still want to want to want more. They're still going to want more vertical field of view. They're still going to want more pixel density. Um, the the big thing in optics I want to see is or in in, uh, in VR lenses and displays is HDR. I want to see brighter, better yeah, contrast. That'll be great. But I also liked that. What was the one that we saw from the Finnish company with? Um, yeah, Vario. Vario with the, with the high definition the center, center part of the display. Yeah. It's like it's like a hard coded or you know, hardware coded uh, foveated rendering where only the center is high def. And mm-hmm. that was super compelling. And that didn't have a wide FOV, even no. for the wide angle. No. One. Yeah. Yeah. Trade offs. It's, yeah. it's, it's still in- increment, uh, in- increments and in improvements, iterative improvements. Uh, NVIDIA at Seagraph announced a new Quadro GPU. Uh, we think this is the one, this is the precursor to their 280 um, line. And uh, this is the first GPU with a built-in Virtual Link VR port. This is the standard port that we'll see in the future, high bandwidth uh, data, power, uh, and, um, and video uh, for VR devices. And remind me, has everyone signed on to that yeah. port? All the major players. Um, and uh, doing, doing some math, it's uh, basically uh, the throughput will give you at 90 hertz, um, like... 2K, at least 2K by 2K per eye. Okay. 2 point something K per eye. 2K. Okay. VR dinner? Um, oh, did you see this? I thought this was I saw the photo. stupidest so the, thing. Well, now, are you saying that because you weren't invited? <laughs> no. I, I'm thinking <laughs> Oculus, for, to promote their Oculus Go, they partnered with some celebrities in New York. I think this is, uh, uh, what's her name? Chloe, Chloe Grace um, Moretz and did a a curated dinner mm. where they paired mm-hmm. each of the dishes with an Oculus Go experience. Sign me up. What's the problem? The problem is that they didn't, I don't think they went far enough. Conceptually, <laughs> sure. If you want this to be some some fancy schmancy socialite thing, you know, uh, to, to, to show famous people using your, your VR headset, great. But what they did was they didn't design the experiences. They create from the ground up video for the content, right? It wasn't like watch this specific video. Everything was a consistent experience. Watch this video that will show you where this dish was made. Like be in the farm where the farm fresh eggs were harvested before you have this egg. Oh, whatever. It was pre-existing, pre- like pre-existing off the shelf experience huh. that they just picked. That's boring. <laughs> <laughs> Which did, is like, did they add trackers to the food so your food was tracked? No, this is three degrees. This is Oculus Go. I'm kidding. Like, how do you do that? <laughs> Can't add edible trackers. Right. It's like oh, it's like oh, you will have. Uh, you will watch Hulu. They use the Hulu experience to watch a Handmaid's Tale to have the uh, Mother's Milk Punch. Okay. No. no. It's pretty stupid. No. It's pretty stupid. I, if there's one thing I've learned from watching Handmaid's Tale, don't watch that near, like, dinner time. That is not a good, like, relaxing watch. Yeah. yeah. So did this Nintendo Switch thing end up being a rumor? I, I put this into Slack because it looked like, oh, I want that to be true. But some hacker supposedly found a setting inside the Nintendo Switch to enable test VR mode. And it just puts the images of a, of a game side by side on the screen. So you could imagine in maybe one of the, uh, the cardboard you know, toys that they make, maybe there's like the robot one. If you put the, heads, if you put the Switch in the front right, of that right, right, right. at the proper distance, maybe you could make a 3D image appear on it like a view. I don't think that's ever going to be a thing for Nintendo. Yeah, I'm I'm afraid it won't. There's either. no tracking on on the switch. It's only no, it's, I know it's only it, rotational. So it would be like a three doff kind of thing. But the weird thing is, it's just like you'd have to have 720p the right, screen. You have to have the right lenses. And, yeah, yeah. It's it's Google. It's a Google Cardboard for Nintendo Switch. But what do you think this is? Is this a fake? Do you think this is real? 
the, so, the screenshot of the yeah. stuff uh, software. I, I'm sure I'm, I would. I would believe that they experimented with it, and it's just leftover software. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't think it's real. Okay. I mean, all it is is two lines of code. Right. Right. They is all all this person found. So I, uh, I believe it's some artifact. Did you see that video of someone um, putting a version of Beat Saber for Nintendo Switch, not to wear on your head, but basically just to hold the Joy Cons to s- just use their rotational movement hmm. as Beat Saber and to play Beat Saber basically not in VR. Okay. Compelling. I guess so. Yeah, because all you—it's like drumming, mm-hmm. and it, you got the vibration, you got the tap, you got the HD engine, you know, haptic engines on on the uh, on the Joy Cons. But there's no positional, so how does it know? It's, it turns out for Beat Saber, you don't really need positional. You're just swiping. Hmm. I mean, okay. you don't do the left and right dodges, right? But you can have that similar experience. Okay. And it turns out people just like slicing things, through things with Light laser lasers. swords. Yeah, yeah, Fruit Ninja, I think, told us that exactly. It's Are you Ninja on the- to a beat? Are you on the Beat Saber exercise regimen? No, no. No. Someone put up the entire Shrek movie. Was it Shrek? On on Beat Saber. I think there was somebody that posted that they what? lost like 80 pounds or something. Yeah, Dan Emmerich, our friend, he he wears weights on his wrist and plays the game. The whole of Shrek is on Beat Saber as a downloadable track. That's too much. <laughs> That's too much. So this uh, past weekend, I got a Ring 2. I bought a Ring 2 and installed it. Uh, this is the uh, smart doorbell home security system thing uh, mm-hmm. owned by Amazon. Bought one. It came with a free Echo Dot. Cool. cool. Um, so I guess those are just commodity items now. Uh, and Hey, can we listen to you more in your house? Here's, yeah, here, exactly. here's a way to do that. And can we see who's at your front door all the time? George Norris. Um, this is uh, the wire cutter's uh, top review. They, they actually had swapped, uh, promoted the ring to over another uh, previous top pick, which is the reason, one of the reasons I, I got it. And I gotta say, like, I'm not super sold on it. I have a ring one, and uh, I think I've told Norm a couple times before you got this, like how much I dislike this thing, mm. just because of of its hardware inconsistency. Connection to Wi-Fi is spotty. Yeah, you're the talking about a, d- a doorbell re- experience has to be right on. Like, yeah. You want to get that notification. You want to connect to the, the camera right away. Talk to the guy. So what I found is notification pops up pretty quickly. Okay. And notification on, on, on all our phones. Good start. Um, and then launching the app to get the video signal to load, that takes a couple seconds longer than I hope yeah. than, I, than, I, than I need it to. Because the whole time, somebody's standing at your door waiting for an answer at the door. Yeah. Are they expecting you to open the door or are they expecting the voice comm? Right. If I'm not at home, then great. I can tell them I'm not at home mm-hmm. and give them specific instructions, but it's still taking a couple seconds. Uh, and yes, it records everything. There's a motion tracker. Uh, it's very sensitive. It also, has, this one has a battery built in, which uh, so far they say it'll last six months to a year. I think it's going to be once a month. It, it, it took me about like I made it, I think, five weeks. Yeah. Before so. changing out the battery. Yeah, I mean, it's just charging via charging mic- oh, micro that's USB. That's another thing to charge, a battery for your smart doorbell once you a month. You can wire it into your existing yeah. doorbell if you want, but that's sort of a pain. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll be using it more, but so far, n- it's not something I, I feel like is solved, a solved problem. I assume you'll be testing the Magic Leap a little bit more this week? Yep, and we'll be talking more about that on projections. I have been testing Iron Maiden Pro Pinball, my friends, and it is the freaking bee's knees. I sold a Whitewater in order to get it. Uh, And Whitewater is a fantastic game from the early 90s, and I love it. And they don't make them anymore, and I'll be sad to let it go. But I got a good price for it, and I put it towards this uh, used Iron Maiden Pro. And this is a new one, new game. Iron right? Maiden is came out maybe four months ago. It, it's designed by Keith Elwin, world championship pinball players, won more world championships than anyone else, and he knows how to design a game, it turns out. I, I have never felt like this playing a game, playing a pinball game. I've always enjoyed pinball to a large degree, but like when I play this game, I get excited like I'm playing a first-person shooter or something. It is so fast-paced and so challenging, and the shots are so uh, like the, they're hard in a way that it, every time I drain, I feel like it's my fault. I don't feel like I got cheated by the game. I'm just not good enough. But you're not a metal guy, so you're not like an Iron Maiden honk. So. I didn't know any of this music. I'd never heard this music. 
but now like I'm all right with it. You know, I'm getting I'm getting in the groove. I like me some uh wasted days. Um I like uh Run for the Hills. I'm waiting for them to come out with like an old school rap pinball machine, like a Sugar Hill Gang mm-hmm. Dude, pinball yeah. machine. Run DMC. You'll be on that so quick. I would quick. love that. Yeah, yeah. Give that. I have a uh, Dragon Con coming up in 2 weeks. I oh think uh Bill Duran and I will both be there from the Tested Fam. I am doing six cosplays this year, and I have been, I put together this, um, this uh, Marvel related jacket, I will say, for a mashup that I'm not announcing publicly yet. When is Dragon Con? It's uh, Labor Labor Day Day weekend, so it's two weeks. All right. And I've been testing out both painting and staining leather as part of this. Oh, you can watch process. a test the video about painting leather on the site right now. Yes. Um, I learned quite a bit uh, about uh, the process of painting leather. And uh, it's slow going, but I think it'll be totally worth it. By the way, this this project made me overcome my like, oh, I don't know how to sew. You can just learn how to sew. It's not that bad. And it's such a skill to learn how to sew. Mm -hmm. If there's one thing like I've learned from watching Adam make all of these fantastic costumes of the year, I feel like sewing is one of those that he goes back to a lot when it comes to cosplay. So I I think I'm going to explore sewing a lot more in the coming months. Uh, But if you're at Dragon Con, definitely say hi. You may not be able to recognize me. Um, in different costumes, but definitely say hello. I'll be on a lot of science panels, and I'll be helping register people to vote as well. What city is that? Atlanta? Yeah. All right. Uh, And lastly, uh, Monday night, if you live in the Bay Area, I'm hosting a screening of Contact with Jill Tarter, um, who, if you... There's a great Offworld episode on the site that Ariel Waldman uh, and Norm were in, uh, talking to Jill about her experience of having herself transformed on screen into the Jodie Foster character, uh, she'll be uh, watching the movie with us and, and telling us tales from the set. I saw an astounding GIF uh, movie clip from that site, from that movie yesterday that I didn't remember. It was this girl running through a hallway um, to, to the bathroom, and she reaches out to open up the medicine cabinet, and the shot becomes the reflection. Like you've been watching her in the reflection the whole time, but there's no possible way that could have been the shot. Yeah. Incredible, incredible editing. So it makes me want to see it again. It's a great movie. And that does it for this week's episode of This Is Only a Test. Thank you all for listening. We'll be back next week. Maybe talk a little bit more about Magic Leap. Um, talk more about PR. Talk more about tech. Talk more about pop culture. If you have an outro song you'd like us to play at the end of the podcast, you can please add it to the long form post that's on the site right now. Just search This Is Only a Test outro and on Google, and you'll find a link there. Uh, and thank you all for submitting your outro songs. We really appreciate it. We're also running uh, the uh, Weta series for our premium member community. So uh, uh, the week at Weta where we spent making the short film, Farewell to Arms, where I believe in part five of that series, testing that blood rig. You should all check it out. Um, and thanks for your support for making that series happen. Jeremy, we had an intro or outro this week. Justin, a.k.a. Speed, has come through again. You know, I was watching one of those Wired videos where they have like the first famous person answering tweet, uh, tweets and it was the PUBG uh, creative director. Oh. And I saw a tweet pop up um, that he answered and it was from Justin, a.k.a. Speed. Oh, nice. Your collective excitement about Iron Maiden pinball is disappointing, friends. I, I have no, I'm totally I into this. Play. I'm telling you, there are people saying, is this the best pinball game ever made? And what's the answer to that question? People are like, it could be. It You're could selling be. us TV on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> no, all you, Actually, what's happening here is you being like, I think I have the greatest pinball game ever made. I'm going to go home. And you don't invite us over. Oh, uh, no. There you go. Please come. All right. See ya.